Run is only with Dom Hart. Hey, what's your program? Hey, what's that? What's your program? When do you put this out? Uh, each Monday. Each, each Monday. Monday an episode comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, we're on now. John Hart. Hello. Welcome to Run is Only with Dom Harvey. Hi, Dom. I don't know how you got Run is Only and you got me. Well, you know. It's a, you know. Well, this is. A, I launched the podcast um, at the beginning of uh, 2022, and it was like a run. I thought I'm so late to the podcast game. I need like a niche, and I, I love running, so I thought everyone's got some connection to running. So it started off with that as a niche, but it sort of evolved quite a bit. Yeah, it's great. probably probably time for a rebrand. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure if you're expecting me to run. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming over. This, I, I, I um, tried to research you online. Is this your first ever podcast? Uh, yes, it is. I've been yeah. um, probably pretty quiet in recent times and out of out of the public eye, but um, working hard at the things I love and um, enjoying retirement or semi-retirement mm. and, um, yeah, having fun. A lot of uh, players that you coached over the years would find it very hard to believe that you've been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, oh, <laughs> is that fair? I can't believe that. Um, <laughs> I, I want to start, maybe a little icebreaker here. It's one of the most recognisable voices that uh, you'll get to hear. Um, I asked someone for a comment on you. He'll be a good guest, uh, absolute cracker of a talker and the first thing I'd say about John Hart, New Zealand rugby was very, very lucky to have him as coach in 1996, that's when the game went professional, Hardy had 25 years odd corporate experience with Fletcher Challenge, so knew everything about a work-life balance, knew everything about contracting, um, uh, just just sorting out both on and off field affairs, so we are bloody lucky uh, to have him there and super, super organised incredibly organised and a brilliant uh, motivational speaker. So sat down with you and made it very, very clear uh, what was expected of you. Your job, nothing more, nothing less, but brilliant uh, looking in your eye and making sure you understood uh, what was required. Yeah, Ian Jones, one of the greatest all ever. That's very nice. Yeah, how, how, I mean, I've got another message to play from him, but f- before we get into that, like, how, how does that make you feel when you've had that impact on someone? Yeah, that's nice. I mean, um, you never know that sometimes, you know, you never hear those sort of comments and, um, you know, I, there's no doubt that, sorry, no doubt going into the um, professional era was totally new, new for everyone and, uh, and probably my background helped in that regard. So um, I appreciate his words and, and I don't think people ever understand how difficult it was going to, into the professional era. I mean, uh, there was a lot of shifts uh, for at all levels of the game and all contributors, and uh, professionalism uh, wasn't as smooth or as easy as it might have been, but we worked hard at it, and um, I wasn't always the most popular coach because I had to make some pretty hard decisions, particularly in terms of what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable. Um, in terms of how do you mean? Well, behaviours. Um, you know, the old days and the amateur days, what went on tour stayed on tour. Um, standards were possibly a lot more average. Um, in the professional era, you were owned by the public, you were in the public eye, and you had a responsibility. And um, And I think, you know, that mean we had to change some of the things that were traditional in the All Blacks, and some people didn't like that. Some mm-hmm. players re- reacted to that. But I know it was the right thing, and ultimately we got it right. Because mm. was there... I mean, I've got no idea what the All Black folds like now, like whether there's the still, still the, uh, the back bus thing with uh, senior players or that sort of us versus them mentality with the, the senior. Um, yeah, was it, you look back now under the 2023 gaze, was there sort of elements of almost bullying in a way? Look, I, 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 I'm not close to it right now, yeah. but, but, but I would think that's well and truly gone, yeah. that sense of uh, bullying. And, um, and there was that. It was involved pretty heavily before I was involved. I mean, I used to be, I used to be quite shocked at some of the things I saw and read um, in terms of some of the behaviour, uh, team behaviours. But, look, professionalism's evolved. People have grown with it. Um, I think you see really a very different attitude now to, to young people wanting to succeed, to older players wanting to help younger players, that everyone's focused on team versus uh, maybe individual. And so I think um, you know, there's a lot more cohesiveness, unity, and in and, and the end, a better product. Yeah. Well, it just wasn't a, wasn't a thing back then, was it? I, I remember I, I was a um, broadcaster in um, Palmas North at the time in the 90s, and uh, I was uh, so I worked in the morning doing a breakfast radio show, then I was free all day. So when rugby became professional, um, 
I became best friends with some rugby players at the time because we all had all this free time. So there was uh, Christian Callan, yeah. uh, Mark Ranby, do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Mark, well. Dion Waller, Kristen Co- Davis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so coached we coached all of those guys. I, I didn't coach Dion, but I coached those guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we, we used to kick around together. But um, yeah, I, th- I think Chris, Christian was shy by nature until you get to know him. And I think he found it incredibly intimidating at the time yeah. with the older players, you know, yeah. Fitzy and Carmo and whoever else. Well, it's only natural, I guess, um, you know, for young people, particularly if they come in um, pretty inexperienced as well, um, and all of a sudden to be exposed to th- that sort of level of player and, and everything that goes with it, the aura around them. Mm. Um, yeah, you do come in a bit quiet. And, and, and possibly that's a good thing, mm. because you come in and learn. <laughs> you don't want to be a loud mouth. Yeah, or well, a, you want to learn, yeah. and, you, and you want to understand. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think that, 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 that helps them all grow ultimately. Yeah. Okay, I've got another message to play you from um, Ian Jones. Now, if you know corporate people, like I'm sure you do, when you're sacked from your corporate job um, and they give you the spiel, you actually walk away feeling fucking good about yourself. Um, And that, by the way, John Hart uh, relayed the news to me in 99. I wasn't playing, um, telling you everything you can and can't do, what they can and can't do for you until you walk away. Uh, realising that you were in the team. But to Hardy's credit, he gave me an opportunity, gave me a chance, and I was back in the 99 Rugby World Cup squad my final year under John Hart. So not only fond things to say about that man, um, and boy, you're going to have some fun and hear some stories. Yeah, yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, that's nice, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, your corporate experience, like you were a lifer at Fletcher's, that must have um, prepared you well for those difficult conversations. But, um can't be ever easy telling someone, um, sorry, you haven't made the cut. Never. <laughs> and uh, anyone that finds it easy, finds that easy. Uh, as I a really savage. Did, as yeah. a savage, yeah. yeah. I think, um, you know, they're always really difficult conversations to have. I always had a belief that honesty was the most important thing. I still do on those things. I think it's really important that you tell people as it is um, and you help them manage through it. You know, I mean, it's... Um, you. It's not easy, you know, and and I remember those times with Carmo. You know, it was a difficult time. Your backs were having a tough time in '98, um, after f- two fantastic years in '96 and '97. Yeah, 17 and out of 18 wins. Yeah, wins. and um, you know, '98 was difficult. We lost all our experience, a lot of experience, and uh, you know, th- we went through a lot of change. And and uh, a guy like Carmo, um, you know, he showed his qualities because he stuck at it. He believed in himself, and he believed in the All Blacks. And he got back in, and um, he was always a real, um, he was a pro. Mm. And, uh, you know, you need those sort of leaders, you need those sort of people. And, and at a time when I think um, we lacked a bit of experience and leadership, because in 98, after 98, we, effect- we effectively had lost after 97 Fitzpatrick, um, Olo Browns, and Sam Brook, uh, Frank Bunce, uh, Michael Jones. I mean, a huge amount mm. of experience. Yeah. So people like Carmo, who understood the history and understood what was you know needed to be a great All Black was still very important to the game. Yeah, so he, he obviously took that conversation well. How, how did other players, did, did players, um, did, did they cry with the news? Does anyone get angry and defensive? Uh, um, look, I, I'm not going to talk about those, no, no, the no. odd one that did, but yes, yeah, some react. Um, but in the end, I think it, as long as you're honest and you believe in what you're saying, um, they go away and they they'll, they'll think it through mm. and, and and look they'll never accept it, you mm. know they'll never players will well, never accept well, it. Well, it's, it's it, personal, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. I mean, um, greatest example for me was was back in the Auckland days and uh, you know that great team in the 80, 80 eras, eighties era. Um, John McDermott um, was playing for uh, university. Um, it was after you know it was a, 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 he he'd played um, he did. Fantastic year. Um, he was playing well for Auckland. and But I decided that the time had come for me to introduce a new player who I had huge hopes for. And I had to tell John that, you know, I wasn't selecting him for this next game. He was devastated. Mm. And I, I can appreciate it because he, he'd done all he could do. You know, I couldn't ask for any more. Um, and that player just happened to be Michael Jones. Mm. And, um, okay. you know, Michael Jones came in 
uh, and obviously the career just took off. Um, and I'll never forget that game because uh, McD was in the uh, reserves and uh, in those days reserves didn't get on. So he's sitting behind me and Michael Jones had a fantastic debut, scored a few tries, it looked absolutely brilliant. And with about three minutes to go, I get a whack on the back <laughs> and it's from McDermott. He said, did you see that, Hardy? I said, what? Michael Jones, he just missed a tackle. <laughs> so it's sort of, you know, and we're still great mates. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, um, I think, I think honesty and um, people, as long as you've got good reasons for your decisions, mm. I think you got to, you got to, and you've got to think about those decisions and make sure you communicate yeah. effectively. Yeah. Was, did McDermott say he was available to play on Sundays? <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose that was one of the differences. <laughs> He'd play any day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you've had uh, two books out, um, Straight from the Heart and Change of Heart. First one, uh, Straight from the Heart, came out before you even got to coach the All Blacks. And the last chapter of that book, there's um, a sentence in there that I want to run through. If the coach, So this is before you got to coach the All Blacks. If the coaching career, which I never actively planned, which grew like topsy and gave me a life, gave my life a whole new dimension, is in fact now over. The good memories will far outweigh the disappointments. I've got, I've got three questions from that one sentence. First of all, what is topsy? What is topsy? Is well, that a weed? Yeah, no. It, I mean, all careers are up and down. Oh, you know, I mean, oh, like topsy turvy. Yeah, topsy turvy. Okay. Yep. Okay. Not the not the one you eat. No, no. Okay. No. <laughs> um, the ice block. Yeah. Was, yeah. Okay. No. No. There. Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, you said the coaching career is one that you never actively planned. What, what do you mean? How did you fall into it? Well, I never planned to coach. Right. Um, I was. Um, um, I had did I, my first coaching um, experience was when I was eighteen, and I coached at university, and I coached my young brother's team, um, and so I got into coaching in that sense. Early, but then I went into playing, and I never thought about coaching until I went to Waitamata. Matter. Um, when I, I switched to Waitamata Matter in 1970, had a couple of years there, uh, three years there, and um, then the coach retired, and um, the manager at the time, Ray Vuksic, who was a great old guy and a great, great stalwart of Waitamata Matter and, and Yugoslav rugby, um, he said to me, "Why don't you be a player coach?" And I'd never wow, thought of what a player coach of. meant. Yeah, and uh, you'd always get selected. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, <laughs> yeah, you'd never drop yourself. <laughs> but so I thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll I'll think about that. And I got into it in 1974. I became player coach of Waitamata, Matter, and I picked a very good assistant, um, DJ Graham, um, John Graham, the headmaster, and great All Black, and. Uh, um, he and I had been involved in the Auckland team. I was a reserve. I was never good enough to play, really. I was normally a reserve. So and you were a halfback, but you, you were quite handy, right? You were never all black level. But uh, I was an average halfback okay. that um, was lucky to get what I got. Okay. You know? um, I think I was um, I was a competitor, and I think that got me a long way. I didn't have the skills. I mean, couldn't kick with my left foot, couldn't pass with my left hand, so you just wouldn't get by today and <laughs> with those sort of things. You know, I was pretty. Yeah, I yeah. thought I was pretty ordinary, but I got a few games. Yeah. But so he said, I said, would you come and help me? And so he said, well, of course, he's committed to the school, but he came and helped me. I used to go and pick him up in the little mini on uh, Tuesday and Thursdays and drive out to Waitamata, and that's how my career started. wasn't planned at all. And the following year, we won the the Gallagher Shield, won the championship. So you know, that it got off to a pretty good start. And then. Y- so you weren't like a massive planner until I, I suppose it got, got to the time where you were sort of in the all black fold. Did you just sort of like evolve and roll with opportunities that came your way? Well, to be fair, um, planning and, and thinking ahead has always been part of my life with yes. Fletcher's. I mean, um, I was, you know, hugely involved in the, 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 the growth of Fletcher's as a company and I learned and understood man management very early in my in my life. And, and so... Um, Coaching was coaching really fell out of that because it used the, used many of the same skills um, that you require in managing people in a business and managing managing a football team, and so um, you know it evolved from there. And uh, I was really fortunate, I guess. I coached Waitamata Matter for s- seven years or so, yeah. and then I managed to get the Auckland Auckland mm. job, and and you know that was that was a huge experience and. Interesting thing, looking back, I mean, I was full-time employed by Fletcher Challenge as a 
employee relations manager of that company in, in those days. Um, and it was, a, it was a big company, right? Like one of the huge, biggest companies in New Zealand. Huge. It was yeah. the biggest. Oh, the biggest. Yeah, yeah. well, f- I, I worked for Fletcher's initially. Um, I joined them in, in 1967 or 66. Um, and then Fletcher Challenge was formed when Tasman Bolton Paper, Challenge Corporation and Fletcher's all came together. So it was an amalgamation of three of New Zealand's largest companies to become New Zealand's largest company. And it was, um, you know, at one stage... We employed thirty thousand people around the world, so it was a it was a real big mm. company, and I led that HR function for many years. Mm. Towards towards the end, just while we're on the Fletcher's thing, towards the end, it must have been like you were you were taking the piss with the job. And the respect that, uh, like I've had J- Sir John Kerwin on the podcast, and he talks about we'll get into this. He he talks about coming and having a meeting with you with his dad. Um, so you were conduct you were just you were coaching, all right? You were, yeah, it was, well, it was an office for your coaching job. I don't, think, I don't think Fletcher <laughs> saw it that way. I, I'll have to ask you, Fletcher, yeah. but I don't think he would have seen it that way. But um, look, they merged, you know. It was, I mean, I look back, that's just not possible today. You couldn't do a job like I had, which was full-time and, yeah, and yeah. full-on, you know. I mean, I had a big a big role in that company at that stage. And here I am coaching a, a, a provincial team as well. Mm. I mean, I don't know. I often say to myself, how, do, how did that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, were, you, were, you, were you just busy working, burning the candle at both ends? Like you, you, so you, I, I mean, I was joking before. I was being cheeky. No, but you no. were obviously doing the Fletcher stuff well and the rugby stuff well. Well, I had to, or else I wouldn't have had either. So, yeah. Um, yeah so, so, so it absolutely wasn't one of those. You, you know when rugby was still amateur and yep. players were given token jobs? Yep. So you might have someone that's um, merchandising with Coke or whatever. Yep. One, one, of the, one of the big advertisers. Wasn't that. It, it was a proper job. Yeah, it was a proper <laughs> job. Yeah, it wasn't semi-professional. No, no, it was. It was and um, I, I was lucky, I guess, I had really good people around me. I've always been a great believer that if you want to be successful, you've got to surround yourself by good people, mm-hmm. better than yourself. Wherever you can get people who are better than yourself, the areas that they're in. And, 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 and look, I had at Fletcher's, um, in those days, I had a fantastic team of people under me at, at running the HR function. Um, and as a consequence, you know, that helped because mm. um, I, could, I could manage. Um, and, and I did the same thing um, with Auckland. I make sure I got really good people around me and, um, you know, tested the boundaries a bit by challenging the system and, and, and changing the processes in terms of how, who would be a manager, how would a manager be selected. I mean, um, I wanted the best, not just one of the rest. Mm. Um, and so managed to get that changed and something they'd done for 100 years and appointed a delegate, a club delegate was always, a, a, they'd take turns at being manager of the Auckland team, um, and things like that. So I made sure that I, y- you can't succeed unless you have good structure and good people. Yeah. And, and I learned that early and I've always practiced it and I do it today. Yeah, how good. Yeah, so the, the, so the John Kerwin thing, he, he told the story and I, I get the, you know, there's, um, there's three versions to every story, right? There's his, Probably his, four in his case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like it's a story that he's, he's told over the years and it's been refined and it's, um, it's like a punchline now. Yeah. Um, but there's his version of events, your version of events, and the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but he said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, that yep. um, he was a young player. Him and his dad came to see you in your office high up at Fletcher's yep. and you wanted him to play in the Auckland B team. Yep. And his dad said, no, it's the A team or nothing. And his dad's mentality was, um, well, yeah, if he plays in the B team and plays badly, it's the end of his career. If he plays in the A team and he plays badly, it's like, well, come on, he's a boy in the A team. But y- you weren't the sort of guy that suffers fools. Like, you're, n- you're not going to be have your arm twisted by some upstart potential All Blacks, future All Blacks dad. Yeah, I think there's um, there's definitely two sides to that story. <laughs> um, and I'll have to um, sort of correct JK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not far away. Um, look. JK was someone that I identified through some colleagues. Eric Boggs was one who told me to watch this young guy. He'd seen him in a club game. So, um, no, I asked him to go and watch John Kerwin uh, as an 18-year-old playing for Auckland third grade, uh, Univers- uh, Marist third grade. And he came back to me with glowing results. And I went and watched him again myself. And he would not know. Uh, no one knew. I was behind a... <laughs> end of a field just just watching this kid play you know in, a, in, in the up blocks and and I said wow I don't think I've ever seen sort of things like it you know big rangy skillful you know 
presence, had everything. And uh, so I, I then managed to get him into a game, a barbarian game, um, which was opening. I think it was the Massey Club Rooms were being opened, and um, they were having a, a game, and uh, it was a barbarian team playing. I was involved in the barbarian club. I got him in that team, played out, played uh, Joe Stanley inside him um, to to to, mm-hmm. to look after him and whatever, and went really well. And I I, I thought now. 1983 was 100 years of Auckland rugby and there were two teams being picked to play a centennial fixture, an Auckland A team and an Auckland B team, which I had to pick both. Um, and, and they were both playing team composite teams from around the country. So obviously the best team, the Auckland A team, were playing all the All Blacks in, 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 you know, from the provinces and, and, s- and the next lot were in the B team. And I decided that I wanted to play John, but I didn't want him to fail. Because mm-hmm. I knew at 18, um, you know, it was a huge risk because he's coming from third grade. He hadn't played a senior game of rugby. Yeah. And so I'm putting him into... so into big boys. Yeah. So I sort of um, came out with a strategy publicly which said um, John is... JK is going to represent the youth of Auckland in the centennial. So if it didn't work, he could go back to third grade or go back to his club. Mm-hmm. If it did, he's on the way. But so I predict him his father actually never said no he, he, it's a team or not <laughs> i actually told his father i was going to play him in the b team yeah and then i went away and thought if i'm going to make this kid successful i got to put him with the best and so having people like gary cunningham in those days joe stanley with him was probably very important so so there's a little bit of a twist there <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's but not, you know it's, they it's did come story. to my office and we you know we had a, a fantastic chat i mean and john was a butcher's apprentice mm. he, he, he could hardly write i mean i've still got the note that he wrote to me which i'm sure not sure and just after not sure i understand what it says now <laughs> either, but you know amazing why have you kept that oh, it's just history yeah do, you know do you, are you are you um not not a hoarder. A hoarder would suggest you've got like rooms full of. But are you like a sentimentalist in a way? Yeah, or? I'm a sentimentalist, and I I like to to keep things that are important to me. And J.K. was important to me. I mean, right. he became a good friend. As but but, well. you, but you did, at the time you kept this um, shoddily written note, you didn't you didn't know the importance of or no. you didn't know what he was going to come on to become. No, but I had a view on him. Right. I sort of. You just hang on to these notes just in case. No, well, I, I didn't get many. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote because he couldn't write. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I know, I know you're only half joking when you say that. I mean, we we started with those voice notes from um, Ian Jones, um, but, but yeah, it's, is it a weird relationship with coach and player? Like, I'm guessing there's some that you end up friends with, and some that end up, end up hating your guts, and then there's probably like a large band in the middle. Yeah, I, I, it's probably that way. You yeah. know? Um, I'm really delighted that. A lot of my friends today remain the team of the 80s, the Auckland team of the 80s. I mean, uh, I have a lot of uh, personal friendships that remain um, out of that team in the 80s. Um, so I always look back on that and it's pretty special. I mean, I coached the professional era and I coached the Auckland team mm. and we created a very special Auckland team in the 80s from nothing um, with a whole, whole attitude to say we're going to make this professional. Uh, professional didn't mean money. Professional meant how it was organised and, and planned. And, you know, i, I got to say, out of that came some wonderful friendships, some very, you know, fantastic players. Um, and if I ever look back on my career, the, iron, the ironic thing was I coached in both the professional and the um, amateur era. Yeah. The most professional team I ever coached was the team in the 80s, the Auckland team, which was amateur. And... And I say that because they just had such a we, – we grew such a professional attitude um, and we wanted to be the best and we had great camaraderie and we did a whole lot of new things, introduced, you know, bringing partners to functions which had never been allowed before. Um, we had a whole attitude to, to growing growing a team. And, and, and I look back and, you know, in those days we got um, a pair of boots and a tracksuit. And you handed the tracksuit back at the end of the year. <laughs> that was that was it. That was you know, um, wow. and and no, not a cent. And and um, and I just look back with a lot of pleasure and pride um, with the memories of the people that we grew through that through that Auckland team, and they were a very professional outfit. Mm. 
Even if um, John Cohen was bringing, sav- in his own words, like Savaloys and lunch into the absolutely, I mean, yeah, but that was part of the. That yeah. was sort of part of the. You know, so you didn't have dietitians. Nutrition wasn't. Okay. You know, geez, we didn't understand nutrition. Uh, there was none of that going on. Yeah. So yeah, no, no. It's all those were the sorts of things that made it special. You know, all the contributions made by so many people. You know, yeah. I mean, it was fantastic. Oh, I love that. I love that. I actually read an article the other day by chance about um, Steve McDowell and talking just about what a trailblazer he was because he yep. was in the gym before anyone else. Yeah. So this was a. Uh, they weren't weightlifting then per se. No, yeah. I mean, we didn't know what gyms were. Yeah. We didn't. You know, I mean, the team in the eighties, we didn't know what a gym was. We we, we didn't mm. train in gyms. We we trained on around the rugby field and you ran and and it's interesting mm. that. that the dramatic change in the body types, um, mm. you know, uh, as a result of um, the whole attitude to strength and conditioning has totally changed. Yeah. It was all about fitness. It wasn't so much about strength, but it's, we seem to get by all right. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you did all right. We did all yeah, right. So speaking of that Auckland, Auckland um, era, which was just wildly successful, mm-hmm. um, do, do you think... That's part of the reason why you were so polarizing with a lot of New Zealanders. Because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I was, like, I, I wasn't ever massively into rugby, but I was in um, yeah, Palmas North in the eighties yep. and nineties, and there was a, definitely an us versus them mentality. Like the yep. Aucklanders were called Jaffers, yeah, you know, just another fucking Aucklander, and yeah. there was that sort of Auckland, like sort of hatred in a way. Oh, look, think I think was it was always there, and, yeah. and I probably, in some people's minds, epitomised, um, you know, Jaffer, because um, <laughs> I, I wasn't. Yeah. Wasn't shy to express an opinion uh, or a view, and uh, I had, and I think people didn't like that. And then people don't like success, and uh, you know, tall poppy syndrome, yeah. loud, you know, was very much uh, alive and well in those days. And uh, still I'm sure, is, I think. Oh, it still is, mm. and and so that that was that was tough. Um, didn't worry me at the time really, because I was more focused internally on what we were doing rather than what, worrying what others were thinking. But it got brought home pretty much when we went to Canterbury in, in the 80s, and 83 and 85. Mm. I mean, mm. yeah, it was... Nasty. It wasn't good. It wasn't yeah. good. Oh, I, I just remember I had a third question from that, um, yep. that yeah, first yeah. book. So, um, uh, yeah, this is your first book, Straight from the Heart. Um, in the last chapter, it says, If the coaching career, which I never actively planned, but which grew like Topsy and gave, me a whole, gave my life a whole new dimension, is in fact now over, the good memories will far outweigh the disappointments. Um so that was before you even coached the All Blacks. So sitting here now as a 77-year-old man, everything you went through, um, do the good memories far outweigh the disappointments? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Oh, no, look, I'm, um, I'm really proud of what, what I managed to achieve and who I worked with, and, 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 and I love the game, and I love New Zealand. I'm a passionate Kiwi, yeah. and I'm a passionate rugby person. And, uh, look, I just was so honoured to coach the All Blacks, um, ultimately. But if it hadn't happened, I'd had such a great time with Auckland. I'd coached New Zealand Colts for four years and unbeaten and, and you know, had a whole run of, uh, you know, success between before I coached the All Blacks again. I never thought I'd coach the All Blacks in the end. Um, you know, I got rejected and... Oh, time and time. Three, yeah, let, three okay, times. Okay, let, let's get into that because um, I, th- I think it says something about, um, you know, persistence and dogged yes. determination and resilience and all this. Dumb, these. maybe dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just like a man with like laser precision focus, I think they knew exactly what he wanted. So you were um, like assistant coach in 87 when we won the first World Cup. You're one of the co- part of the coaching. Yeah, yeah. I was. So I was, um, uh, I was Brian a selector. Lahore. Brian Lahore was the coach, and Alex Wiley and I were brought in as new selectors. '86 was a horror year. Remember that was the Cavaliers' year, and they'd gone to France at the end of the year and hadn't had a lot of success. And and we had a World Cup in March. So new selector, new selection panel got picked uh, in October of eighty um, of '86, and Alex and I were. Alex was very successful with Canterbury. I was very Chris successful. Wiley, Alex Wiley. Chris, yeah. And um, we came together with, um, and we were assistant coaches to to um, to Brian, and he did a brilliant job in leading that World Cup. But I think we had fantastic influence, um, particularly in selection, um, because Brian, you know, was involved in the team in 86 and probably was more committed to the past. Alex and I had a very little... Um, surprised some people. We had a very common view on selection, um, and you know we worked hard to create a great squad for that um, World Cup. Um, and I think I look back, you know, and I think when we were about 
four months out from the World Cup. So that was that was just probably January. We wrote down our teams, and ultimately Alex and I got. I think we both got 23 and 24 out of a 26. Wow. And I think Brian got about 17. So mm. that said, we had a lot of influence mm. together in sort of forcing change. And players like Michael Jones, who hadn't been heard of, was all of a sudden elevated. And and, yeah. and we had to get – we tried, We decided we wanted to play a game at a different speed and a different style from what had been traditional. And so a lot of the older All Blacks, the traditional props and locks uh, – you know, got bypassed, and we picked a really mobile, aggressive team, and and so I look back on that as uh, you know, fun. When we're in the North Island, I would be coaching, helping uh, Brian. When we're in the South Island, Alex would coach. We were never there together. He didn't want too many voices, and he's probably right on that. I think he was a pretty good judge, Brian. I think. He <laughs> yeah, because what, what, <laughs> what was the um, dynamic like with you and Grizz Wiley at the time? You you couldn't imagine two more different human beings. Yeah. Now look, um, there's been a lot written about us as being you know totally apart and you know well, like hate, personality clash personality hating each other clash and all those things. Um, I have a huge respect for Grizz um, I, I saw what he did with Canterbury uh, and and I think he had a mutual respect we had very similar attitudes to selection but we were totally different in the way you manage people and what you did and and so you know when we came when we we're put together it, it wasn't going to work because totally different philosophies of how to get the best out of people and whatever. And I'm not saying he was right and I was yeah, yeah. wrong or, or vice versa. They were totally different, been very successful in our own ways. But you put them together, uh, as the New Zealand Union decided to do in 91 after you know things weren't looking too good before the World Cup, it was doomed to fail because, um, you know, it just we were very different. Mm. But huge respect, always will have that and uh, we'll retain that forever. Mm. So when you see each other now, both both as like senior men in the twilight years, really, um, what's it like? Well, I don't see a lot of them, oh. but I sent him a note. In fact, at, I was watching his wet and forget ads, oh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> they're on a lot, aren't know, they? And, 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 and I see they were they were he had all these old players, and I, I, I decided to contact them and said I rang him, I texted him and said, look, I. We haven't spoken for a while, but and but I've got grey hair, and I reckon I'd make your team if you're looking for someone to join you and you're wet and forget uh, team. Give oh, me a call. Nice. So uh, and he came back, so that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, look, um, the media wrote a lot in those days um, about that conflict, um, and they made a lot more of it than it was. But there was no doubt there was differences. So there's yeah, no point yeah. in me trying to. I'm not sugarcoating it. I so mean, you weren't you weren't best mates. You weren't sharing a room. No, or <laughs> no. I mean, I couldn't quite keep up with his drinking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, while we're on this, so that was the um. Yeah. So during the eighty seven, did, did the so you never won um the World Cup. We'll get to that later as as um the head coach. But did 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 you sort of feel like the eighty seven success was partially yours? Oh, I think so. Yeah. And yeah. I think those involved would say that Alex and I made a real contribution, and I know we did. Yeah. Um, I think we did in many ways. Um, so, um, although it was really interesting, I mean, the New Zealand Union uh, treated you very differently. You, uh, like when they had the photo of the team, um, we weren't allowed to be in the photo. Oh, is that right? Yeah. No coaches? <laughs> yeah. No, right. no, Brian was, but not right. us. Oh, okay. So the two selectors and assistants weren't in the photo, you know, so... Um, don't have an official record of it, actually. <laughs> so, but, you know, we, yeah, I'm sure we may help to make a difference. Yeah. And, and I'm sure Alex and I and Brian, uh, we work really well together. And, and to, that's to Brian's great credit, that he managed to manage the personalities and got the best out of both of us. And I think uh, the success of the World Cup was very much about his leadership of the three of us. Mm. And then, the, the, so the next All Black coach after that, that was Laurie Maines. Yep. Now, you, 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 guys, you guys hated each other, right? Well, no, the next no? coach was Wiley. Oh, oh what? okay, Grizz. Yeah, yep. Grizz got it. Um, at the end of 87, uh, we went on a tour to Japan. I took the New Zealand team to Japan, and he was my assistant coach. And when we came back, the politics took over, and mm. um, it was always going to be Grizz and not me, and he got appointed. And then, so Grizz then went through to, to um, 91, and then f after 91... Um, Unfortunately, because of what happened on the tour in 91, I should never have gone as a co-coach. I was, uh, I have to say, I was told if, 
if I didn't, it would be the end of my aspirations. Right. And so I was put in a pretty invidious position, and I still... Damned if you do, damned yeah, if you Yeah, I still wanted to coach the All Blacks, but it never worked. It never worked. It was a, it was a disappointment. The All Blacks weren't actually going that well that year. Um, I don't think putting me in there helped at all um, because Alex didn't really want me there, and I don't blame him. I mean, I don't want so, you wouldn't want someone put upon you. Um, mm. And all of a sudden, <laughs> he's a co-coach, not the coach. Yeah. And so at the end of '91, um, I because we lost that World Cup, um, I think consequences were that those that, those that didn't like me had an excuse again, and um, mm. away I went again into the wilderness. Yeah, wilderness. And what did that look like? Wilderness for a couple of years. Um, well, yeah, because I got out of coaching, really. Um, Did you? you so you, you, yeah. go, you go home, what do you say to your family? Like, that said, I'm done? Well, I didn't say I was done. Um, I, 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 I sort of kept involved in the game on the peripheral of it. But, um, you know, I, I effectively, when I came back into coaching the All Blacks in 96, I'd been about three years out of coaching. So it was a huge step. But I think the whole, um, you know, Laurie went through good and bad times. Uh in 94, things weren't travelling too well when I got asked to stand again because they were thinking of making a change wow. to the coach. And they were, uh, it was close, but it, it, they didn't change. So mm. I missed an 87, 91, 94. So mm. 95 came along. It was a big risk. Yeah, so, so in, in those years where you, where you weren't doing any coaching, you were, you were commentating, right? I d- did a lot of commentating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard a I – mean, you never know if any of these things are true um, – but I heard that when Laurie Maines would watch like repeats of the game on VHS, he had to have the volume down because he couldn't stand your voice. <laughs> Is that have you heard that? No, I wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> really? <laughs> wouldn't surprise we're, we're, me. We're the southern, he's a southern yeah, man. He's yeah. a southern man, you know. So was it was that a frosty relationship with you two or it was never I don't know, really. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really have a lot to do with each other. I mean, um he I mean he he's a he's a really committed and he gave everything he had. Um, you know, uh, we 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 had our we had our differences, um, you know. But when I got the all back job, I first port a call. I went down to see him because I wanted to pick his brains mm. and get an exchange of information. And um, he was very helpful in that regard. So yeah, you move forward. Yeah, you know? if you see see each other now, how how would it? Yeah, be? Absolutely, no problem yeah. at all. See yeah. him at golf down at the hills occasionally. So. Yeah, does he go all right? You kick his ass? Or? No, I couldn't. No, <laughs> no he, he's too good for me at golf. Right. Okay, so so then you. Uh, you finally get the the all black job, um, and, and you know you must. Have, I, I don't know. It must have been a frustrating time for you because you 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 knew your skill set, you knew your qualifications, you knew on many occasions you were the right guy for the job. You, you keep getting overlooked. It must have pissed you off. Um, like, or, yeah. or, or, or I mean, did you feel like defeated, heartbroken, yeah. angry? All of those. Yeah. Yeah, all of those. I mean, I went through a lot of. You know, I, I thought in '87 uh, I'd probably done enough to be the coach, um, but um, the council decided I was, it was very political. Dom, mm. it was the, the whole selection process was terribly political. It was who, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't about. I mean, we didn't even get interviewed in those days. I mean, it was just it was just politicking. Who you know, and uh, yeah. who you. Who, 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 uh, which councillors liked you and which councillors didn't. And uh, eventually, in 95, there was a far more formal process. Um, and I think that helped me because, you know, I was used to that sort of thing. Mm. And um, I think um, in the end, you know, there were quite a few people standing in, in 95 um, for that all black job. Um, but I think probably my, my presentation helped me, my background helped me. Um, and it's a bit, it's a bit like Kamu's alluded to, I guess. Um, this was coaching the All Blacks in '96 was dramatically different from coaching the All Blacks in '95. From amateur versus professional. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I Dram- suppose you had the professional skill set from your years. Yeah, so I think that helped, mm-hmm. you know. And um, so, and finally, finally got it, and it was fantastic. It was on my fiftieth birthday. Yeah, yeah, so B- best fiftieth birthday ever. Um, yeah, December six. December sixth. December yeah. sixth, nineteen ninety five. And um, there's another thing that, I, from a personal perspective, that I like about this. I, I turned fifty this year, and yeah. it's. Um, I feel like I'm just getting started. Like yeah. I feel like life's a sports game, and first half's over. Now it's into the second half. Yeah. And here you are, fifty years old, just landing the you know, one of the biggest jobs in the country. It's bloody awesome. It's cool. Yeah. It was and you, in compared to like Graham Henry, you were young when you got the job. Yeah. Well, it was sort of. Um, <laughs> um, well, imagine getting if I'd got it back in 
you know, 87, you know, you were 39, 38. So in many ways, probably was the right time, mm. you know, more experience and I was a better coach and probably better equipped than I was then. Still, I was still probably learning. Um, so I think, you know, to hear that day, uh, to get the phone call at, at my office and we were celebrating my birthday at the office and uh, got the phone call and, and then to go home and have 50, 60 of your best best mates there for your 50th birthday that's what was all planned to we had no idea that that was the day the Mm. all black coach was going to be announced and um wow it turned in quite a party yeah yeah and um and what a run like you you referenced this before the first couple of years 17 out of 18 and i feel like being um so um auckland centric (laughs) or at least the nationwide perception you 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 had to be winning every game you you had to. That was the only outcome acceptable, really. Yeah, I was under pressure to, yeah. to probably. Expect, I can't imagine the pressure expectation, but um, you know, I think we we did manage to move to professionalism really well. I mean, once I got the job, I did a lot of study on what made su- professional teams successful, and I studied NFL and, and 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 basketball, and I looked at major sports and that had gone professional, and I learned quickly that there were so many pitfalls mm. for players and coaches and administrators and it, it sort of scared me a bit and I thought I don't think we really understand what professionalism is because it's not just turning up today and now you're paid and yesterday you weren't. Um, this, as I said earlier, all the responsibilities and everything changes and the whole media attitude changes. Everything, you know, you're, 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 in, you're in the face. So one of the things I did in February um, was hold a seminar um, where I talked about the role and the responsibilities of professionalism and I brought a group of uh, speakers together from all walks of different walks of life, Paul, Paul Holmes from the media, oh, yeah, yeah. Doug Mackay who was in the chief executive mm-hmm. of Lion Nathan, Ricky Ellison, the American footballer, uh, New Zealand based um, who'd, who'd, who'd won um, who'd, who'd won Super Bowls um, in America, I brought wow. him out to speak um, and had all sorts of discussions going on in terms of just alluding this is just this is different and you've all got to understand you know if you now pay two hundred thousand dollars a year when you were paid nothing last year um you got to learn to live off 50 or 60 and save save the rest and start to build build your future you know because there was none of that none of that thinking and i i saw young guys just wasting money consumed by it families taking whatever you know Mm -hmm. um so I think that was really important to address those issues and a lot of those issues, you know, I mean, when you look at some of those sports, the rate of divorce, the, the suicide, um, alcoholism, or gambling, mm. all those things that um, were very, very dangerous um, and still are, still are out there in many ways um, were challenges that we all had to be aware of and, and most importantly, we had to understand that we had a responsibility to perform on and off the field. You were no longer, it was no longer acceptable to be anything but presented well off mm. the field. Yeah, that kind of, I mean, you, you hear about lotto winners that have no financial literacy yeah. and then they come into this large sum of money and then it's gone within a couple of years. And I mm. suppose it's the same sort of thing, maybe a bit of easy come, easy go. But um, there was so many stories about Jonah over those years, like the team bus would stop in a different town and he'd go to a Harvey Norman or Selectrix or whatever it was and buy like a boom box for the bus or... There'd be a, a young player in Wellington that'd take under his wing and buy a car. Um, so you didn't do a good job coaching him about them. <laughs> no. Let, hey, let, I let's, mean. Yeah, let, let's, let, let's talk about him because um, like from the outside, that seems like the most um, the, 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 the most unusual dynamic ever. Like here you are, middle-aged, middle-aged white New Zealand man, him, this phenomenon of the sport, a Tongan giant from South Auckland. Um, yet there's a, a photo in your book of you and him talking on the field and you were the spokesperson at the funeral for the family when, when he passed away. So it must have been um, a special relationship. I always wondered about that, 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 that relationship because I thought maybe um, maybe you you dealt with Jonah through, I don't know, like Frank Barnes or Eric Rush or something, but you, you and Jonah had quite a, quite a good one-on-one relationship? Yeah, we did, and we um, worked at that. Um, oh, look, he... How? You would have had nothing in common, though. No, not a lot. Just that you're both uh, one-on-one. But... Um, he was a phenomenon, phenomenon. He was just unbelievable as a uh, what he could do. And I look back on his career, and you know he was playing at his peak, 
probably because of his health, probably at 60 or 70 percent maximum ability, and because of his restrictions. Um, imagine what he would have been mm. like if he was 100. So, no, he was fantastic, and he came out of obviously came out of the World Cup in '95 as a superstar, yeah. And he was the face of rugby, and um, and I saw that firsthand because I was over there. T- uh, doing the TV commentaries at the Rugby World Cup. So I saw what this phenomenon and what, what, what it was. And it was quickly evident to me that you needed to protect them because he was just being pulled from pillar to post. Everyone wanted a bit of Jonah. And so, and of course, we went to Africa in 96, which was, you know, probably one of my greatest memories of coaching the All Blacks was winning that series in South Africa. And Jonah um, had come off, what a super career in 95 and was struggling with injuries mm. and obviously struggling yeah, with, with the a kidney kidney yeah. problem which i didn't know about yeah. but was obviously then affecting him uh, but he had a knee injury on that too so he never really shone he, mm. he, he, he was only he got on the reserve bench once in our test series mm. in there um you know he just wasn't quite what he was but i used to watch the public just adored him and and we had to we had to put people around him to protect him really to keep to, to give him so he could could live a life because mm. otherwise his, his life was consumed um, look we kept we kept contact um, you know we 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 were at, as you say we we're very different different people but hard to imagine two more different people yeah but we had a fantastic relationship yeah. and uh, actually am, am, I'm, am I um just imagining this or on one of his homes TV show appearances were you there sitting next to him yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's when he marriage broke up and uh is that when he no when he when he got married without telling his parents no 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 you don't no, yeah sorry yeah I think I'm trying to think back right I'm I'm getting old I mean, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> yeah. it's a long time ago yeah 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 but a, the, there the, was the, one time when uh, I went on the home show with him to help um, explain and help him through a situation I think it was the wedding that the parents didn't mm. know about you're right yeah but yeah. you know we had that trust mm. and respect and. Uh, you know, I just, um, you know, tragic the way his life ended so early. And, um, yeah, know. very much so. And then to hear about the financial stuff afterwards. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just sad all around. Yeah, it was a sad, sad finish to a great career. Yeah. But it's not nice to hear that you guys had that sort of um, special relationship or bond. Yeah, how, how, do you, how, like, how do you coach someone like him? Everyone talked about how he was had no defensive skill. Yeah, well, I, th- I think with some of those players, you don't try to overcoach them. Yeah, you just, um, just let you, them play you know, their natural. Let them play what's in front of them and let them do what's natural. But they have to understand they've got to do the dark side of a game sometimes as well. You know, and <laughs> what's the, that? The tackling, defense, the dirty work. Defense, yeah. you got to tackle, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know those those things are a bit different. So, but um, he was look, he always struggled with his fitness because obviously of the kidney. I mean, he he was the worst at doing you know the the the, the running test that we used to do um, you know he, he you know he, he just he didn't have the stamina mm. and i've seen many times at the end of this particular exercise we used to do to to test everyone you know zinni and frank bunce sean going back and running running with him to get him across the finishing mm. line because they all wanted them to play and they wanted them to succeed Little did we know what was going on with his body. Yeah, so that must have been frustrating. Like at, at the time, I'm guessing, um, but you don't even have to admit this, but you must have been like, shit, this, is this guy lazy? What's yeah. he been doing on the off season? Must have been incredibly frustrating. It was frustrating, yeah. and, and that's what I started to wonder. I, I did. I, I, I sort of said, is he really, is he really, what's he, what's he about? You know, because he just wasn't, he couldn't do it. The doctor would always, my very good friend John May, who, mm. who was his doctor, he was in an invidious position because he wasn't able to tell me, but he was the team doctor. Oh, so Joan and you, it, it had been diagnosed at yeah, this point, but John, he was keeping it a secret. Yeah, they were trying to manage it. Right. And uh, then following, finally in 97, it all, all came out. 96, yeah. 97. Mm. Yeah, shit, you had some good players in, uh, in that time, didn't you? You had like Jeff Wilson at his prime, Cully at his prime, Mertz, Marshall. Yeah, you look back at guys like Justin, Andrew Mertens, Frank Bunce, he was a legend. Um, Jeff Wilson... Um, Christian Cullen, you know, Tana Umanga, Joan mm. Alomo. And then you go, that's before you go to the forwards, mm. and then you go to Brook, Zinzan Brook, probably one of the most skillful rugby players that's ever played the game. Uh, Michael Jones, Josh Cronfeld, Ian Jones, Robin Brook, mm. Sean Fitzpatrick, Olo Brown, Craig Dowd. 
man, that 96 team was pretty special. A hell of a team. That was a hell, hell of a team. team. Were, were, you, were you coaching, I forget what game it was, when Zinni scored a drop goal from the best part of halfway? Well, was he, that during your era? He scored two big drop right. goals. Do you, yeah. as, as a coach, even though he landed them, do, do, you, do you tell him off for that? Or afterwards, are you like, what the fuck are well, you doing? Well, we were playing, we were in Pretoria, and we'd won the first test of a series, and it was a three-test series. And as you know, no one had ever won a series in South Africa before. In Pretoria, we had to win to win the series. Or if we lost, we went to the last game in Johannesburg, which was going to be a hell of a, mm. hell of a, hell of a mountain for us because we'd played eight, 11 tests in 13 weeks, 14 weeks. So it was really, we were coming to the end of it. And we were just in front. And I see Zinni getting himself positioned <laughs> behind the buddy ruck. And I I think, no, because the backs were in front of him. And I thought, no, gets it charged down, seven points at the other end of the field. Mm-hmm. Should I have worried? Straight between the posts. <laughs> he, uh, he was a legend. A number eight drop kicking goals, you know. <laughs> How good. The it's only so, decision so he had to make was which foot he used, I yeah. think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and what about um, Kelly, my old mate? How, like, how, do you, how, can, how do you coach someone like that? Apart from maybe not be so selfish with the ball and pass it a bit more? Like, oh, look, Kelly was just a natural. Um, probably the most brilliant gifted footballer that I saw in my time in just terms of brilliance. Um, the best footballer I ever saw was um, Michael Jones, I think, all mm. round. But mm. Cully was exceptional, had exceptional speed. Um, the tries he scored early on, you know. I mean, he, he probably suffered a little bit and uh, as the game changed a bit and, 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 the, and it became a two-pivot game more. F- fullback had to come up and do a lot more of the reading and running a game. That wasn't his strength. He was an instinctive player. Mm. Um, you know, he just did things naturally, and he was brilliant. And, um, you know, 96-97, uh, he, he had some fantastic moments for us. He, he scored tries that you don't see. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, you know, I have huge respect for him. Um, you know, 1999 moved him to centre, criticised, you know, Big Blue. I had Jonah, Tana... Um, Jeff Wilson and um, and Cully and and four just brilliant, all the best you could have, and we didn't have a centre. And so I worked on Christian's game to say that he was that. Now we lost the World Cup because of that. So say the experts. <laughs> there was no way we lost him. Oh, the, there was I, no way because we shifted him to centre. Yeah, that didn't cost us. I'd look back at those games. He played well, and that wasn't a problem at all. Um, we lost the game because we probably just weren't mm. good enough in the in the all round leadership stakes uh, to when the when the crunch came. Yeah, that's got to be annoying, eh? The um the yeah, mon- Monday morning coaches or, you know, armchair quarterbacks, whatever you, whatever you want to call them, it's, it, that's got to be frustrating as fuck. Yeah, well, and, and, and invariably, Don, people got no idea about the background of these no. things, you know, and they, they just look at it very simply from Are you playing him out of position? Yeah, like, he's out of position, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, who said he's not a natural at that position as well, yeah. you know, um, and I, I defend that, you know. Um, I look back probably, I probably, when I look back, Maybe Tana might have been a better centre, straight centre than um, than Christian, and Tana did end up there. Mm. Um, so you know that would be probably you know I'd, I'd admit that. But at the hindsight's time, hindsight's a pointless game though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it it's doesn't no, prove much. No. You can't do much with it. But um, I don't have any regrets in that way. I mean, I you know I, I think um, you know Cully Cully would have been he he would have found that tough. I think, um, but. You know, he's he's a guy that I've watched grow too. I mm. think he's 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 grown beyond the you know out of a game. He's grown a lot more as a person uh, than he was in the game. And um, you know, I mean, I think back to when we won the series in Africa in '96, and he was brilliant at fullback. But he had really no appreciation of winning the series in South Africa, mm. and that's not his fault. He was a young man, mm. you know. Uh, so it probably was lost on him at the time. <laughs> you know, yeah, he, yeah. he couldn't work out why he he would be saying, well. Um, Don Clark came up to him and the because uh, I know this happened. Don Clark came up to him as the players were coming off in the tunnel after Pretoria, and Don Clark was had tears streaming down his eyes and wanted to meet Christian Cullen. 
Now, I don't uh, think Kelly would have known who Don Clark was. Yeah. You know, because that's just, uh, you know, it was, he was a young man and uh, um, just uh, where Don Clark was obviously in our time and before, uh, you know, a, 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 a giant of the game. Mm. And, and he just loved the fact we'd finally won in Africa because he tried and, and failed. And uh, and I, I still see that photo of Christian looking at him sort of, who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Why is he crying? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah. Okay, so then came the um, the 1999 uh, Rugby World Cup, which um, I don't know, I suppose, uh, I was going to say it's bittersweet, but it's probably just bitter, actually. Mainly what bitter. It? Yeah. I don't think there was much sweet in it. So, um, um, so, so, yeah, so the All Blacks lost to France in the semi-final, yeah. and then um, in the playoff for third or fourth, which nobody wants, we lost yeah. to Africa. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just move, move, moving forward before we park on this for a bit. So... For you as an ex-coach in 2003 and 2007, when, when the All Blacks don't win, is there a little bit of relief in you? Like, see, it no, is never hard relief. to win. No, no relief. No, but you know what I mean? Because you like want it. them to win. Yeah, yeah. But you say, well, I hope people understand it's not that easy. Yes. You know? Um, and you just, you, there's no, you don't have a God-given right to be, because we we're supposedly the best team, a God-given right to win a World Cup. It never happens that mm. way. Uh, so, um, yeah, 99 was tough. Really tough. Because we'd come off the back of a really hard year in 98 because we'd lost five tests, three of them by that much, um, you know, and, and it was hard. But 99, we, we got our act back together pretty well. Mm. Um, we stabilised. We had a really good success. We won the Tri-Nations. We thrashed Australia, thrashed South Africa, uh, in, you know, in the Tri-Nations. Um, and then had a, a loss to Australia in the last game before we went to, to uh, the World Cup. And, look, we just... I don't know. We we, we we were okay at the World Cup. Um, we had some big wins. Um, uh, but coming into France, I, I was always worried about France. And I remember a saying I had was expect the unexpected. And I talked about it in that, for mm. that game because I, I thought that's what you had to prepare for um, because they were, they'll do anything. And look, by half time, we were dominant. Um, and I still got my team talk that I had on my, my, my on my um on my program, telling them what we should do, um, which was just screw them into the corners and don't give them anything. We didn't do that. Uh, we ran the ball. We dropped the ball. We we gave them turned over position, and they had twenty minutes of magical mm. rugby where nothing went wrong. Every bounce just went their way. Everything went against us, and the game turned and. We had a young captain, young leadership group, and I don't. Who, who was the was Tain it Tain, Handel. right? Yeah, and I think uh, it's not his fault. I'm not. I'm not blaming him. No. I'm saying, but we had a young leadership group generally, and and as a result of that, we just didn't really handle the turnaround, and and in the end, we got beaten, and you know that was that was tragic because we we really were a better side, a far better side than France. We should have won. And had we the won same that, thing could be said about uh, was it two thousand and seven? Absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, bloody French but again. It's one game, yeah, you know, and French again. Look what's coming up, you know. Look at <laughs> no, let's not look at this let's year. Think I think it. it's fantastic. We're <laughs> playing <laughs> France first up. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so so you're, you're the All Black coach. Um, you're knocked out of the Rugby World Cup sooner than what uh, definitely what you want. Um, so you're dealing with that sort of like heartbreak or numbness or disappointment or whatever, and then um, and then you got to deal with everything everything else. Like, how, how do the immediate like days or hours after that look? So you feel the the heat of the media immediately. Huge, yeah, huge. Um, it was. I've never been in a dressing room like it after the game. Uh, the team was shattered um, because they were hot favourites and and we didn't win. Tane Randall, who's supposed the captain's supposed to do a pre post match interview within I think it's about three minutes or four minutes mm -hmm. of finishing, was in no state to do that. And and so I had the front and um, and you know, I took accountability from the start, which I thought you should do. Um, I, I I look back and I think I got let down a bit by some of the players in that day, but Overall, you're still accountable in terms of what them not fronting up, or yeah, not doing probably not yeah. playing as they should have, or maybe you know going off the 
going off for team pattern a bit. Okay. And so it was some of that, but you know, I'd never name individuals in that regard because it was my responsibility. Actually, you're just pausing here. So we've been talking for almost an hour. That is one thing. Um, it's quite striking actually that I've noticed about you in this past hour. You've never, you haven't said a bad word about anyone. You've never blamed anyone for anything. And I mean, you're an old old man now. Now, if you, if you had any um, scores to settle, now would be the time to do that. And I think it says a lot about your character. Yeah, I think um, you've got to accept accountability. Yeah, you know, and um, and I had to, and and that was the most difficult period of my life. There's no doubt that um, I went through some things after the return. Um, it was a horrible time in my life, and it started really straight after the game. And the media were into me. There were certain media who just wanted payback. I don't know what reasons, but they want to pay back. Oh, you can name them. Who? Well, <laughs> no, you don't. Phil Gifford was <laughs> one. Oh, really? <laughs> Murray Deaker yeah. was another. Really? Yeah, yeah. And they, 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 mm. they, they just took aim, and and I had to take a decision um, what to do because I was most of the players weren't going home; they were staying in Europe and having holidays. I decided um, that I would, after testing the water with. A very good colleague, John Hood, who was, um, was used to be Chancellor of Auckland University and who was someone I employed at Fletcher's and worked for at Fletcher's in the end. Um, just one person, a very special man in my life. Um, and I rang him to get the feeling at home and what I th- should I resign straight away or should I come back and, you know... Yeah, because this was pre-internet. Yeah. Pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, I he said it was pretty grim and um, in the end I advised the rugby union that I would I was resigning the irony was the rugby union had talked to me about possibly taking a new role the following year of you know GM of the All Blacks and mm. under a, it was a, bring a new coach in uh, which is something I sort of had a vision on uh, of what you could do mm-hmm. in terms of the brand and in terms of the whole thing um, so all of a sudden I had to make that decision and I made it um, it was pretty hard my family were over there um, they came home I followed them and arrived back and worst time of my life. Yeah, so th- th- I mean, there's there's one incident which um, we'll get into as much or as little as you want uh, involving the, the races in Christchurch. But so when you get back, is there anyone at the airport? Is, yeah, is it, there was some media, not a lot. Yeah, uh, okay. But so my family were there. And my, it your, your wife at the time? Yeah, and my wife and Judy and uh, my son and daughter. How old, K, how old, K K Chris. How old were they? Uh, well, they were, um, you know, sort of 17, oh. uh, sort of, you know, sort of ages, yeah, yeah 18, yeah. 19, uh, no, 20, 20 and, 20 and 17, yeah. And Chris, God bless him, said to me, Dad, Holmes DG starting in the Auckland Cup, uh, in the New Zealand Trotting Cup tomorrow in Addington, why don't we go down? And I thought, well, maybe that's a good thing to do, get out and, you know. And so the four of us, Went down to watch Holmes DG, who was fantastic. Uh, I love horses, so I had a lot. I've had a lot of fun in my mm. life with horses, and he was. He won thirteen group once. He was just super horse, mm. and he was the favourite to win the uh, New Zealand Cup with a race I'd never won. So we went down there. It's the worst decision I ever made in my life. It's a day that I will regret for the rest of my life, and I'll never forget the day because mm. it was it was horrible. Um, it's quite interesting, guys. People just abusing you. Um, you so know, you're in the the birdcage area, right, just in the public area, walking around, whatever. Right. Woman, like, t- totally different attitude. Woman uh, empathised, um, came up to me and congratulated me on my career. Um, men just, uh, you know, there was just this, and I had this awful, the most terrible things ever happened to me. I went to a toilet and I'm in there, and this guy comes up to me and said, "You're a." Such and such, and the words I can't pronounce on your your show, but it was the worst words you could hear. And he just spat on my face, and I stood there and I thought, I can't do it. What can I do? You know, I just and that memory will never leave me. And that was what's, that what's was that was horrible. And um, then we go out, and the, the horse, the crowd are throwing beer cans at the horse when he goes out on the t- track. I sort of. I look back and I think the poor horse didn't know I'd lost the World Cup. I mean, he, he sort of, he you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're both like alarmingly despicable acts, but 
I, and in some way, and I should. I, I, I feel more sorry for the horse. Like they, yeah, they, I did too. I mean, I feel, I feel, I feel bloody sorry for you as well. I mean, no, uh, no, no. I'm yeah, not looking for sorrow. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm sorry you went through that. Like, they're, they're, I think there's a f- there's a few shameful points in New Zealand sporting history, and the, the way um the, the way you're treated, I'd say that's number one. Um, the 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 Butterworth Coot stuff, yeah. that was terrible. Pretty awful. Um. Stephen Donald being sent a bullet on the post yeah. after a bet. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, it's gross. Yeah, that so was... Just, so, yeah. so what was the age of the guy in the bathroom? Oh, what he do you was, reckon? Yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can I could see his face at the time. I've lost it now, thank God. Um, but it was just one of those horrible moments. You just don't think, what have I done? You know, I've done my best. I've, uh, I've got a pretty good career record. I've, I've, I've won a lot of things. Um, but, yeah, that was... And that led, unfortunately, to look for two years, three years. Um, I went out of, I went out of profile totally. I, I'd left Fletcher's at that stage. I was on my own. I had my own business consultancy. I did nothing for two years. I was hiding from the public. Uh, I didn't want to be seen. What it, did did you just sort of have like a fear that if you if you showed your face anywhere, you, just you lost confidence. Yeah, yeah, really, lost confidence, and and obviously I was I suffered depression, but I didn't know it at that time. I mean, we just didn't wasn't talk about sort of talked about. We didn't talk about depression. Not even JK was talking about it. Yeah. Then. I remember I couldn't cross no. the road one day. I was so scared to cross. Oh, like anxiety, anxiety, yeah. and uh, you know, my mother and uh, wife Judy took me to Fiji for two weeks to try and to help because they could see that I was in a pretty, bit of a mess. And look, I had two two years in the wilderness and really did nothing. And um, then then a stroke of luck changed my life again. Um, John Bailey, the chairman of Bailey Bailey's Real Estate, um, he must have heard that I was struggling. I didn't even know him. Must have heard that I was, I was struggling. And um, he was... He was organising a fundraiser for um, Team New Zealand, and the aim was to run a six-week online auction. Uh, everyone contributing items and you know bidding, and and then a big dinner. And he asked, he came and asked me, out of the blue, would I would I lead that for him? And and I thought, well, yeah, yeah. I decided to. I don't know why I decided to because I had no confidence in myself at that stage, but. Mm. It was immensely successful. It got me back on the on the road, and more importantly, he then because it was successful, he did really well. And he, a month or so after that, he asked me to go on the board of Bailey's, and uh, I became his the first independent director outside of the family to be on the board of Bailey's, and uh, stayed there for twenty years. I just retired a year ago, and. You know, I owe I owe him and that company so much. So a great company. I mean, I just enjoyed it mm. working with them. But you know, you needed a break, and I got a break. Um, and otherwise, I just don't know what where I'd be. And mm. and life life evolved again. And I found myself and found my confidence. And and you know, went on and I've been doing some fantastic things in the last fifteen years or so. I've really yeah, enjoyed absolutely. life again. It's been yeah. it's been fantastic. I think there's a, g- a good message in there, eh? For a lot of people, it's like um, th- you know. This too shall pass, you know. That's um, I think that was an Abraham Lincoln uh, quote. And th- things do get better, and you know, it never stays stormy forever. But did yeah. you did you get any professional help in that time or anything? No, or I did didn't. You, you, didn't, you didn't even no. see um, your old mate, Doctor John. No, or? well, I didn't know. I, I well, I, I I really probably, I mean, John, John, I was, I was seeing John Mayhew, but yeah. I mean, we were, I, yeah, it's a hard thing to go back and think about because I was obviously depressed. You know, you hear about it today, and mm. I was obviously depressed. I mean, I can remember that I couldn't cross the road. Mm. I, I didn't want to go across. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty bad. And the the, the alarming thing is, that, and and I, I suppose it just goes to show, like, um, the way um, mental illness works. It's like, like you, you weren't a you weren't a, you weren't a kid. You weren't in no. the. You know, you were a, no. a man in your fifties. Yeah, and yeah, uh, you're well established in business, well established established in life. But there was this whole thing in those yeah. days. You wouldn't admit that no you know yeah you, you'd be you got to be bigger than that and better than that and uh stoic I didn't, and i didn't reach yeah. out i didn't well, i didn't know how to reach out mm. interestingly with my background you would have thought i should have been able to reach out yeah o- honestly um jk can't get enough praise for for what he's done like the 
the, the, the cor- courage in speaking out and point it's it's very well spoken about now uh, you know there's a, there's a lot of ambassadors for um, mental health but he's done he did it in a time where it was courageous to he 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 has just been yeah. a fantastic achiever for New Zealand mm. I mean I've just got so much admiration when I look back to that uh, that butcher's apprentice mm. you know and I look at what he's done in his life and the inspiration he has been to so many people um he he's one of our mm. special people, you know. And uh, yeah, oh, because of the work he's done, it means you and I can sit here today absolutely. and talk about this stuff. We wouldn't we wouldn't be. I mean, he's yeah. he's opened the door. He he helped open the door. There's yeah. no doubt about oh, that. Absolutely. And it was uh, yeah. So very grateful for that. Mm. And it, was it was it around this time that your first your first marriage? Yeah. Well, how long how long were you married? Like thirty years or something? Yeah. Yeah. In two thousand and two, <laughs> which was all through my mm. in the times when I wasn't in great shape. To be fair. Um, Judy and I separated. We just grew apart, to be fair. And a- adulting's hard, isn't it? Yeah, and that was <laughs> life's hard. I regret, I regret the way that happened. I don't regret it happening because I'm in a great space, and so she. Yeah, you know, and um, we've got two of the most fantastic kids, um, fantastic family, and and Kay and Chris are so important to me, um, mm. and I'm so proud of what they've done in their lives. I mean, they're just. They're stunningly successful, uh, and they're both beautiful kids. And mm-hmm. so, you know, went through a tough time, um, and my new partner died six months later um, with yeah, I remember breast cancer. I thought I um, heard something about this. Um, I looked, looked for some information online, but it's sort of pre-internet, so there's nothing there. So she was a physiotherapist? Or she was a yeah. yoga teacher. Right, yoga teacher. And in her 30s, and uh, all of a sudden got breast cancer and died within six months so i'd sort of it, life had really collapsed for me again and uh um you know, sure your 50s were rough yeah they weren't great <laughs> <laughs> great but you know then i've met the you know the dream of my life you know um die my wife now you know i was introduced by paul collins so uh, so paul paul and rosie collins um paul became a great mate through we were on the sports foundation together for about 11 years in the 90s um and rosemary rosie his wife is di's best friend and she had a view that rosie decided that di and i should get together and she planned it and we got together and here we are we got married in 2014 and uh you know she's just Mm. a wonderful part of my life and uh my kids love her uh and we you know life's fantastic but um you know, sometimes you've got to go through difficult times to have, have great times as well. But, you know, I always look back on my marriage too and say, you know, um, we, we grew two fantastic kids and, um, you know, I will always uh, respect Judy so much for that. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I don't know what the uh, the stats are when it comes to marriages, but uh, you, when you get married, there's a high chance that it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm, um, I'm still legally married, but me and my, my wife broke up like maybe five or six years ago and... Uh, because you stand in front of all your friends and you, you make promises that you're going to be with each other till you die, anything less than that feels like a failure. Yeah. But realistically, if you're with the same woman for 30 years and you have two kids, I, I don't think you, you've got to be happy with that. That's yeah, a success. Yeah, no, I, I don't look at it now as a failure yeah. at all. I mean, I just, um, you know, I, I just look at my kids. I live my life through the kids yeah. still. You know, when Di and I have just come back from um, Phuket where um, my son and his wife, Missy, and the three, three grandkids... Uh, Jack and Bella and Rosie, 11, 9 and 3. Um, you know, we went up there and my daughter, uh, Kay, and her husband, Dinger, they, they live in Bangkok. Um, Kay's a superwoman. People got no idea what she mm. does, but she's she works for Ford. Mm. And um, she's... Um, I got her... When I was an All Black coach in 99, she needed a six-week um, role to complete a degree. She came out of AUT doing a marketing degree. And I went to Ford and said, would you mind employing Kay for six weeks just for practical experience? You never had to do this practical experience thing. Well, she ended up being employed. They, they liked her so much, they employed her full time. And she's been running, she's been running countries. Uh, she's, wow. And she's now the president of Ford International Markets. So she's got 92 countries reporting to her I mean she's got a humongous job and I'm just so proud of her and uh, I can t- I can tell the way your your eyes light up and you yeah, smile oh, well, I you're... mean she's just a you know wonderful success story yeah. unknown here but you know she's done so well and and Chris has done so well in business 
Um, he was chief executive of Airworks, who are a, 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 prom- a, 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 a New Zealand-based um, um, company. Uh, he grew that, and he's taking some time off now, and his kids in here, and off to Europe to five months, and life's pretty good. You know, mm. I just, uh, yeah. And more importantly to me than their successes is their uh, is their demeanour. They're just wonderful kids and yeah. they're wonderful people, and and people love them. So, mm. you know, you can be very Parenting so important, you know. I, I think if I look at society today, if there's one issue I'd I'd say is is question is questioning mm. when I look at crime and health and education. Yeah, it's that word parenting going across everything because you know I learned great parenting through my mum and dad who had nothing but gave us everything. Uh, you know, um, and I, I I just think it's it's there's no better uh, there's no better thing in your life than to see your children being successful, but more importantly, being good children, good people. Mm. You know, if they're successful as well, that's great, but being good people. Yeah, how, how did you, um, speaking of them, how, like, how did you navigate it during um, the 90s when all this shit it was, was tough. going on? Yeah, yeah. it you, was tough. I mean, they're, they're sort of adults, I guess, at, at young adults in their own right, so yep. you, you don't need to sit down as you would like intermediate age kids. And but how, yeah, how, do you, how do you get through that? What do you, how did uh, you? Yeah, that wasn't, um, that wasn't, that wasn't easy, but they were 20, yeah. 23, 24, and, um, you know... You, so they, they caught backlash as well from... Yeah, well, no, not really, but they, they probably... They felt what I went through. Yeah, I mean, no they doubt. saw it, and they felt it, and uh, they were hurt by it. Um, whether they got backlash themselves, who knows? I mean, they may have, they didn't talk about it, yeah. but... but um, they felt for me and, and and what was going on. So, and they were both very strong supporters and stayed with me. And um, you know, very important part of my life. Mm. Yeah, that was pre-social media as well. Yeah, <laughs> imagine. Yeah, just imagine. I just don't imagine, Dom. I yeah. just hate the thought of. You know, I, I mean, with respect, social media is life today. But there's some real downsides of social media mm. in terms of what it's doing to our community. But honestly, every single person I've had on this show, no one until now has has ever encountered someone being mean to them in real life. Like everyone's had abuse online, but no one. Doctor Ashley Bloomfield said the the worst thing he's had is someone coming up to him saying, "I hope you have a horrible day." <laughs> but compared to being spat on in a fucking bathroom at a horse race, meet, that's nothing. That, yeah. I mean, that is outrageous. Yeah, so, and it was probably all the other things that were going on on that day as well. You know, oh, yeah. the, drinking and the abuse from other people, and okay. yeah. seeing the poor yeah. bloody horse trying to say what he got beaten by a nose. He must have known it wasn't safe for him to win. <laughs> <laughs> he got beaten. He's right. like, I've been hit by cans. He I'm got a little sore. By a nose, he ran second. Yeah. and it, it's quite interesting because um, I think Jenny Shipley was the prime minister at the time, and um, she heard a few things that had gone on because we went home that night straight after the race. We went home. And on the Friday is what they call New Zealand Free For All. It's uh, where all the cup horses race again. And Homes DG won. And I, obviously I wasn't there. Uh, I was mm. at home. And I'll never forget that. that um, the phone went just straight after the race. And it was Jenny Shipley, who I didn't really know. But she was Prime Minister. Yeah. And she was down there to make the presentation. She said, look, I heard what happened to you on... Uh, Tuesday, and I just want to congratulate you um, on winning this race. And sorry that you can't be here to share it, but we're thinking about you. And I thought that was that was really nice. Yeah, it was nice. That was really nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so how, how do you proce- process that thing? Do you uh, you go back to your hotel room? Are you are you just furious with rage? Are you shaken up? Are you upset? Yeah. Well, you're upset. Um, I didn't know how to talk about it even really at the time. But, uh, I was how, so how did it come out? Did you did you bring it up, or did someone else? I Witness think someone him. else right. I'd mentioned it to someone and I think that got okay. released. I didn't go out publicly, yeah. but it, it, that's how it came out. But, um, you know, that's that. look, that's gone. Um, that was just a, 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 a bit of a, a blip in the, in the journey. And, uh, you know, I've, I've come back stronger and yeah, I'm better for it. Yeah, I don't, I'm yeah sorry for dwell, I'm no, probably no, dwelling yeah, yeah. on it a little bit, but I, I just can't get over how outrageous it is. But I, someone, someone, chances are that person's still alive. So someone's walking around today yeah, knowing probably, that they, they did that. Yeah. And I hope they feel immense shame about it and yeah, embarrassment. Probably, maybe they don't. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, how, <laughs> you, must, you must feel like this as, as well. Because when, when, when I was in my 20s, I... Th- so when I was in my 20s and you became All Black coach at 50, I saw 50-year-olds and I thought they were 
fucking old. Yeah. And I thought they knew everything and had yeah. it all figured out. Now I get to 50 and I realise everyone's just learning all the time. Absolutely. Evolving and growing. So that person, I don't know what age they'd be now, but there's someone walking around that is probably mortified by how they acted that day. Who knows you'd who hope they so. are. Who knows where they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... How's the rest of your life looking? What do you reckon? Another good decade left? Another good two decades? Well, look, I'm just, um, I'm sort of semi-retired, but I am working so hard on two things that I'm passionate about. You know, I'm, um, I created this tournament, golf tournament. Um, something happened in 2004. I was invited to play in the Dunhill Classic, the Dunhill, AG Dunhill at um, awesome. St Andrews, the... the Pro Am event, yeah, 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 and um, which was really nice, and because those invitations are not easy to get, and I, and out of that, out of that tournament came two fantastic things that happened to me. Um, firstly, I was paired with Eric Watson, um, as he was the other amateur in my group, so we played together for three days, and he put the hard word on me to come to the. Warriors to help him with the Warriors who were struggling a bit and I said no I could not ever turn my back on rugby um, rugby was my love and I said no and um, and I the other thing was that I learned about this combat this tournament and thought wow you know at the time I was on the PGA board here um, as an independent director they asked me to come on and help them as an independent director and I thought wow some event so anyhow it evolved Two years later, a year and a half later, he kept hammering me and I finally decided, well, rugby hasn't reached out to me at all since 99. Mm. I mean, it's quite interesting looking back. After I resigned, I never heard from New Zealand Rugby Union. Never. Mm. For years. Yeah, and it's kind of a slap in the face really, isn't right it? Right now, you'd say... It just wouldn't be possible today, but in terms uh, of in terms of like the lack of duty of care, or yeah, I, well, both really, yeah. uh, but primarily just common decency. I yeah. would have thought at the yeah. time, but it, you know, it's sort of. So I sort of thought, well, maybe why wouldn't I do something different? And mm. so I agreed to go in there, and I had five of the best years of my life there. At the, you know, it was uh, we we turned things around. Um, I helped recruit and put. Ivan Cleary in as coach. Um, we had some wonderful times. Um, 2011, we had all three Warriors teams in the finals at uh, in Sydney on the on the final day. Final, you know, we had our under 20s, our reserve grade, and our senior team, NRL team, all playing off in the finals, which was just fantastic. Um, and um, you know, so I had a. I, I've got to say, I've got a soft spot for the Warriors because I had five great years there. Um, they made a tragic decision. They should have really done a lot to try and keep Ivan Cleary as a coach. I mean, mm. <laughs> he's gone well, on. He's done all right with Penrith, hasn't he? He's gone on to be one of the greatest. He's probably <laughs> yeah, the best coach yeah, I've yeah, seen. Yeah. He's a fantastic coach. Um, and it's not it's not lost on me that Andrew Webster, who's now doing a fantastic job with the Warriors, was a protege of Ivan Cleary at the uh, Panthers. Mm. And... Uh, I often think back, maybe if Ivan was still here, we might have a son playing for us as well, Nathan. Oh, Nathan, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's not a bad footballer, yeah. is he? But I had, you know, fantastic five years there, mm. and um, and then I came off that, and uh, I came up with this idea to run this uh, golf tournament, and um, went down and saw Michael Hill, and I said, you know, how, how about we try and run a PGA Championship as a pro-am, not heard of, a big tournament, mm. and and uh, he liked the vision, and he, and he's a visionary himself. Um, and so between us, we employed Michael Glading, who became a really become a really. Oh, good I know friend. Michael. He was yeah. the boss of Sony Music for a Absolutely. number of years in Absolutely. New Zealand football, and he's still running the New Zealand Open today. He's so a great man. We've been together for twelve years, and um, we created this event, and it evolved after two years of the PGA Championship. Um, New Zealand Golf came to me and said because the New Zealand Open was going backwards and our tournament was going upwards, and they asked me if I'd take out, make the tournament the New Zealand Open, and um, and which was quite, that was quite a, um, I was really proud of that because there's no Open played in a Pro-Am format around the world every, anywhere. And so mm. we created this tournament and recreated it in uh, 2014, and um, now it's, um, it's, it's just a great event. Mm. It's a... Uh, 
international class event. It's um, you know it was when we started. I think our budget was just under a million dollars, and our prize money was about four hundred. I think we're now at six million dollars. Wow. Uh, we've got international backing. We've we've got sixty percent, seventy percent of our money comes from international uh, across you know Korea, uh, the states, and Indonesia. Um, and we're out Hong Kong, you know, people who are supporting us. Um, and it's one of the three biggest events on the um, Australasian circuit. Um, and it's growing. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event that's showcasing the best of New Zealand. It's bringing huge profile names to New Zealand who in, end up investing. Government have been a great supporter of the tournament because they see, you know, mm. the television pictures alone coming out of Queenstown are pretty special. And so th- that takes a lot of my time. Um, and I, you know, sort of went from the Warriors into that, and um, and then five years ago, New Zealand Rugby, I got a call from New Zealand Rugby and saying, the "Long Blues. time no see." Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah just about. And, uh, Remember us? The, yeah, no. Well, that, the irony was for the 2011 World Cup, I was actually chairman of a task force. I ended up chairman of a task force um, to. Um, to maximise the benefits of the, the World Cup for New Zealand. So yeah. they brought me back in to do something. That was government, really. Yeah, time heals a lot of wounds. Yeah, like it, it does. But it it's does. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny old thing, isn't it? This is something that, that we, we didn't talk about at all. But um, so the 2011 World Cup, what was the score in the final? 7-6? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So 9-7, nine, 9-7. Seven, nine, seven. So yeah. it's, it's a knife. Like Graham Henry, he, w- he would have been... Um, he, he would have been Kicked out of the country, spent the rest of his life in the south of France or two something. Losses. Um, could have had two losses. He could have ended up 2007, 2011. Could have been the, yeah, 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 imagine, imagine knighted, that. But it's, it's a fine, fine line between becoming a legend and, and being deemed a loser. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem fair. Yeah, no, no. I think you just got to accept those things. That's, that's life. Mm. But, you know. Um, but then the New Zealand Rugby Union had bought out the interest of the private shareholder in the Blues and uh, asked me if I'd become one of their directors. And so... Last five years, I've been um, working really hard on the Blues, helping helping put together a really good team, and we've now got a great uh, team of people off the field, mm. chairman, new board, new CEO, new coaches. I mean, everything's changing, and it's quite exciting. We've still got a long way to go, but um, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. And, and now, when New Zealand Rugby wanted to get out of his shareholding, um, I helped uh, with Grant Graham bring together a group to buy the shareholding, mm. and so we're part owners of a place now but we've got some great people involved as owners and you know so I'm sort of retired love golf still got my horses and um, you know chair the New Zealand Open and on the board of the the Blues and I'm doing things now I'm passionate about yeah you know I just want to do I want to give to what I love 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 seeing and love doing and um, yeah life's pretty good life's pretty good yeah, as it should be. And um, you, you sent me a pic um, last night of um, your granddaughter holding <laughs> both of Granddad's books. Yeah. Um, what would you two kids say about you? Are you, are you a bit a, a bit of grandfather than you were a father? Do they complain <laughs> about how you? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Well, I think if you're doing the grandparent thing right, that's what your kids should say. Eh? Like, Grandparents uh, are a bit easier. Yeah, than yeah. You yeah. can give the kids back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you love it. You love being a granddad and um, yeah, you, you're busy doing projects you're passionate about. And you still have so much to offer as well. Yeah, well, wonderful. I'm sort of. I, I, you got to realise, you know, getting to the age I'm getting, it's uh, uh, there's limited time ahead. Mm. But uh, my whole resolve is just to keep enjoying myself and keep contributing, and um, you know, uh, being the best I can be, and um, and and enjoy myself. And mm. you know, I think that's um, you know, I've got some great mates. Um, we we play a lot of golf. We have a lot of fun, and and friendships are, are so important to life. And yeah. and those are the things that I treasure and and work hard at. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry you went through that dark patch, but I'm pleased that you've gone through it. Oh, look, I'm yeah. a better person for going through it. Yeah. I, are you? I, How do you oh, mean? Absolutely. No, no. I I don't look back at that with uh, I. It wasn't a great part of my life, but you learn to become resilient. You you learn mm. a lot about yourself. You know. I think it taught me that. Um, I, I, I would have thought you were resilient anyway. Like you, you, yeah, you got I, knock, I, all those knockdowns when you were going for the All Black job. Yeah, I, I think I was, but I think it 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 showed me how to bounce back, and that was important. You know, I mean, um, a lot of people don't, um, and and I probably, as I say, I owe people like 
John Bailey, uh, mm. Paul Collins, are some special people. Hugh Fletcher. I look back, you know, I've got some special people who I go back to my Fletcher days when I first started at Fletcher's. A guy called George Fraser, who wouldn't be known mm. to many. He was Sir James's right hand man. He was a communist. He was chairman of TV3. He was he was everything, mm. everything different. <coughs> he was my mentor, and I always remember something he said to me. He said. For you to be successful, there's one thing you must remember. Never forget the most important thing in life. And I didn't know what I was going to hear here. And mm. he said, common sense. And I I think I've survived on common sense. And, and I look back at what he taught me. I'm not an intellect. You know, I, I'm, 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 I deal with people that can blow me away. Mm. You know, but I think in common sense terms I, I can see through see what's right and wrong and, and, and see see pathways and I think that's that's always been quite important for me mm. well you're a good communicator and you're truthful as well yeah well that's I think communication's half the battle isn't it yeah. you know and uh, being prepared to front I mean I was a bit reluctant to do this as I told you um, yeah why so just opening, like opening old wounds or <coughs> yeah not so much opening old, oh. old wounds but I'm not seeking publicity really I mean I'm, I'm where I am now but mm. When you talked about it the way you did, you know, share your life, and I, I just think there are lessons to learn. And yeah. I, I think, um, you know, I came out of a, a a whole background where I grew up in a state house, uh, just had, you know, lovely family life. Didn't have anything really in terms of um, anything. I certainly didn't wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I mm. mean, you know, we had nothing, um, but boy, I had everything. Mm. You know, I had a great schooling. I uh, loved Mount Roscoe Grammar, you know, I, I achieved there, I sort of, and it was all about parenting, my parents were so great, and so mm. um, I'm so grateful for that, so, and I think, I look back, and while I don't want to get out there publicly, but, you know, there are lessons that you can share, you know, um, that you can share to, you know, good times and bad times, and I thought, when you spoke to me, I sort of, I talked to a couple of people I trusted, and they said you should do this. And yeah, you told me this. Kerry Woodham yeah, was one who works yeah, at Newstalk ZB. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. And she was really yeah. strongly saying you should do this. It's yeah. good, and he's a good man, and you know oh, it's going to be good for you. And yeah, and, um, yeah so I, as I said to you, I was a bit, I was a bit dubious about doing it, but yeah. I've really enjoyed it, and it's um, well, it's, it's a, it, mate, it's been a hell of a life. So I feel like it's one that's worth um, reflecting on because I, I, I feel like even at your age now, you're still. Like looking forward and looking towards the next thing, um, but you've done a lot, so it's nice to like pause and look back and enjoy some of those moments. I think. Yeah, yeah, and that's it made me. It's made me re just talking to you has made me reflect a lot on my mm. life, and there's been a lot go on there, you know. Mm. And 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 to be fair, ninety percent of it's positive. There's not. Mm. There's not much that's not. So, uh, but the ten percent make you better. Yeah, and you you think about how many players that you, that you coach that are considered great players, even though they never won a won a World Cup. Oh my my God, the list is too long to. To name, um, but I think it's the same with coaches as well. Just because you you didn't win a World Cup on your own, it doesn't mean you weren't a great coach. Yeah, I, I look back. At, I look back at my record and uh, speaks for itself. You know, I eighty eight percent. I can I can put up if I had if you put all my international coaching and all my Auckland coaching and New Zealand coach all first class career, I know that my record will stand the test of any mm. of them. But it's not recognised like that because <laughs> I didn't get a World Cup, but that's okay. I don't go. To, I don't go to bed worrying about I didn't get a World Cup. I go yeah. to bed thinking that you know I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, well, that's exactly my point. No one's saying Jonah. Yeah, not bad. You ever won a World Cup though? <laughs> <laughs> Are yeah, they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, one one final one. This might be the thing that gets uh, picked up in the news, if anything. Um, so the Rugby World Cup's coming up. I, I, uh, did I hear you on Hosking? You you said something about the Ian Foster thing, like you. You, you were asked to comment on that, so you thought um, Ian Foster was a bit hard done by with the look. I the recent um, sort I of don't think um, I'm slow coming backwards on that one. I don't think it was handled really well at all. Yeah. Um, I think what went on last year when he went through that bad patch with Ireland and whatever, um, he, I, I think he was treated pretty roughly personally by the, by the, the New Zealand public I, or the NZRU. Everyone, right? I think collectively, media. I think he. He took, uh, and I've just been um, delighted to see him successful. I mean, it's quite interesting to me. Um, I think the introduction of Joe Smith and Jason Ryan have enabled him to be the coach he needed to be. Um, I think he 
probably made a mistake in the in the quality of the people he had with him and and having to get rid of his assistants. Um, but he made that move, um, and he's brought in two world class people. And as a group now, they are looking a lot stronger. And mm-hmm. and I only wish him well. I had a couple of hours with he and uh, Joe Smith just last week before last week's test, and. It was really refreshing. I was really uh, respectful of listening to him talk about the game. He's 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 a lot smarter than people give him credit for in the game mm. of, in the game of rugby. I think a lot of people wanted to see him fail, and mm. that's that hurts. You know, I've seen that. Um, and the, and the Robert Scott Robertson thing, you know, that was in the background all the time. Um, look, I I think um, he's gonna he's 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 got as good a chance as we the World Cup and the World Cup in two thousand and. 23 is going to be an immensely hard one to win, mm. um, particularly because of the draw. The draw is right against All Blacks, South Africa, France and um, Ireland. The best four teams are in the same two pools. So come quarterfinals, two of them are gone and you're mm. going to see Australia and England go through on the other side. Australia, who are uh, an average team, I, I'm almost certainly will say we'll get in the semifinals and, and yet we could get out knocked out at the quarterfinals mm. because we're going to have to play South Africa or Ireland to get through. But I've got a, f- a feeling about this World Cup that the first game will be the last game. What is that? Oh, t- like the final? I reckon. Who's the first game? First game's France versus All Blacks, mm. and I reckon that'll be the final. I think. Well, I, you would say that you've been stung by France before. Yeah, well, actually, uh, New Zealand's been stung by France many have, times. And, and, but, but and it's in were, France. They're right up now. Yeah. Ireland and France are the top two teams in the country in the world at the moment. South Africa showed their weaknesses last week. Um, by just believing they could come over here and bash us and physically, <laughs> and found that we didn't, we weren't subdued, and and that's why I thought the All Black performance was outstanding physically, and and then our skill was too much for them, um, but they'll be better for it. I'm, I wouldn't write South Africa off. They, <laughs> you won't see that starting team play next time. Mm. You know, they, 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 I think they probably got a bit arrogant in their selections, thought they could physically beat us and then bring their best on to really. To, to destroy us and yeah. it didn't quite work for them so they'll be very competitive but I think France, Australia France, the All Blacks and um, Ireland, South Africa they are the four best teams unfortunately two aren't two are not going to get mm. through but I do believe if we win the quarter final we, we can meet France in the semi-final in the final Are you still fully in, immersed in rugby? You enjoy it? You love it? You Yeah well, I'm totally immersed in the, war- in the Blues the Warriors in yeah, the Blues yeah. you know I've sort of I love that I spent a lot of my time there I've created a, a family foundation for the Blues, and um, you know, got a whole lot of people involved in that, supporting, getting, you know, getting out and getting some really great names in Auckland, supporting the the Blues, and and I'm I'm loving that. So I'm yeah, I'm passionate about the game. I, look, I'm a passionate Kiwi. I just love New Zealand. Mm. Uh, I don't necessarily like what I'm seeing in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah, you know, it's not quite the country that I love, and and hopefully, you know, we, we that gets turned around and. You know, listening to what happened today, you know. We're just yeah, I was about just going to bring that up. Yeah, the, the, we're, shoot, we're filming this on um, Thursday, July 20, and there was a shooting this morning in Commercial yeah. Bay, and uh, yeah, a guy went to work with a gun, and uh, yeah. he's dead, and two other people are dead as well. It's well, awful. That's sad. And, and yeah. particularly, I thought it was really sad, given that it's on the eve of, you know, the, the FIFA World Cup, the, the Women's World Cup, which right. is a big event for New Zealand, mm. so it's not exactly the publicity we want. But, you know... I've got a lot of my mates saying to me, you know, they're thinking about leaving. No way I could leave. I, I, I mm. believe in this country and we'll, we, we've just got to get through it. We've got, to, yeah. we've got to be better. We've got to be better. I love the attitude. I think that's a good place to end it. John Hart, hell of a life. And um, I don't know if, if, we're, if we want to look at it like a game clock. You're into the, maybe the last quarter. Yeah, I'm You're well into a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm well into the last quarter. I don't know. As I said to you just before we started recording, I had um, Arch Jelly sitting in this seat a couple of weeks ago. John Walker's old coach, who's yeah. um, about to turn 101. So you just never know. You're looking yeah. great. I don't know if I get to 101, but thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed being on the program. I appreciate it. John Hart, a great New Zealander. This is Runners Only. Yeah, yeah let's get it started. Hey, hey. This is Runners Only with Dime Harley. Uh, fast pace, slow and steady, any way you coming. Uh, just want to connect for everyone who loves running. Hey, Runners Only with Dime Harley.